All right. So uh, we are a little bit late, but that's okay. We had some technical difficulties. So uh, thanks so much for joining us for this Facebook Live. We finally got everything up and running. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining us tonight is uh, Ella Maxwell, one of our longtime panelists. So before we jump in, Ella, uh, tell everyone what your interests are and uh, what they can find you doing out in the garden. Okay. Well, I'm a horticulturist. I work at a garden center up in Peoria. And I'm also a master gardener and I have a rather large garden. So currently I am weeding. I have a vegetable garden, uh, mowing with all the rain. Um, I, I, I'm planting stuff. I'm still bringing plants home from work. So yeah. <laughs> and now as you drive by, some of the nurseries have uh, sales these last few days so oh well we are kind of holding off because we still well we don't have a lot of inventory and we still have a lot of traffic so it's been real good the annual sales have been fabulous with everyone wanting to garden and adding plants to their lawn or their garden or their landscape so it's been real fun Excellent. Okay, so we've got uh, Facebook questions. We've got some questions folks sent in, and we've all we've I've got a show and tell, and you've got one as well. So uh, why don't you go first? What show and tell do you have, and uh, tell us all about it? Okay. Well, um, I buy the dendrobium, uh, no, the phalaenopsis orchids, uh, especially around Christmas when they're like ten dollars each, and I always look for ones that have two stems of flowers. And they do real well. And then I kind of uh, neglect them. And I watched a video about how to rejuvenate them and some of the problems that people have. So what I'm doing currently with mine is you make a tea solution with uh, tea bags and uh, water and that provides the tannic acid and you soak the roots, you take off all the soil or the little bark chips and the little plug that was underneath where they propagated it and you soak them. And when you do, you can see how green the roots are or how damaged the black dead roots are and you clean it all up. So you soak it for eight hours or 12 hours and then you let them dry for 12 hours and you keep this up for uh, about three days and then you can repot them. And so what it does is it gives you a turgid leaf. Uh, normally, um, and I've got some leaves in here that you can see that are just really sad. And uh, and you can see there's, once I took off the dead roots, there's really nothing left. So I'm hoping to get something, you know, and uh, here's, here's the good roots. So you mm -hmm. can kind of see them. And this is to just help get them back into rooting mode and then this summer i'm hoping to uh be able to grow them better so this is phalaenopsis orchids and uh, i'm soaking them for 12 hours dry for 12 hours in a tea solution and hopefully revive them so so what how did you stumble upon this this um, trip? my husband actually brought it to my attention and thought that Maybe I could save my orchids if I did something. Oh, that was sweet of him. Way to be helpful, husband. <laughs> yes, he is. And, and he put up a album behind us that has plants on it. Oh, wow. What an excellent, excellent guy. Okay, I have a show and tell too. And it is directly connected to you, Ella. I got a package in the mail today. Woo! So it kind of worked out nicely that you were on the show. I was kind of bummed when we were having technical problems because I really wanted to show this off. So um, I asked Ella uh, a few days ago, I was on the hunt for some banana trees. And um, there were a couple places here in town that were sold out. Some hadn't even got them in. And I didn't know if maybe that was a seasonal thing, not seasonal, but I wondered what affected them not being able to get them here or the limited quality here quantity. So anyway, reached out to Ella, of course, um, and she found one for me at her house, actually, and dug this up and put it in the mail for me. So can you tell me a little bit more about this guy and what I need to do um, to make sure that it's nice and healthy this summer? Well, um, the um, 
Banana tree has a large storage root system. So you're gonna just plant it in a quality soil. And um, you can see that I actually broke that off from another hmm. banana. They send up little like pups, just like amaryllis and stuff. And you can see that it's still alive because the main part of the is is kind of cream colored um, yes. and once it starts to grow this would be much like an elephant ear you're going to put it in the soil it once it's warm which it is now and plenty of water and fertilizer you can grow a real banana tree and then uh, in the fall you could try mulching it this is not one of the real hardy varieties but with a lot of mulch people have been able to carry them over um, but you can also just dig it up mm -hmm. and um, in the fall, just like I did. And then I just store them um, in my basement in the dark, right. you know, and, and start them again. And really, I should have brought them out uh, three weeks or four weeks ago, but I'm planning them now. And you've yeah. got one now. I know. I'm so excited. I will. I will definitely reimburse you for this. So, um I'm probably going to dig this guy up and bring it in because the winters here have been so unpredictable. Do you dig all of yours up or do you? Mulch yes. Yes. And then I just line them back out again and they go from that size probably to about three or four inches. Now you probably will not see any flower stalk or anything like that, but you get this wonderful tropical appearance, you know, in your garden and you know, why not? Why not? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I'm going to have, as soon as we finish up, I'm going to have my husband help me get this in the ground. Uh, welcome, Kelly. Hello. 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 <laughs> Glad you could join us tonight. So, um, Kelly, if you could introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit more about your expertise and where they can find you in the garden. Okay, my name is Kelly Alsup, and I am a horticulture educator for University of Illinois Extension. I'm based in Bloomington. Uh, my passion is um, pollinators, beneficial insects. Um, I like uh, vegetables, and um, uh, lately my programs within Extension has all been about urban trees. Okay. And I have a 16-month-old. And Boy, he her busy. Who is a handful. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hopefully he's out playing in the dirt with you, too, and starting him early. He he loves rocks. He puts them in his mouth all the time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we've got a lot of Facebook questions that have come in, and I'm just going to start throwing these out there. If you guys don't mind, we'll do like a little speed round. Uh, Kathy Kaufman Smith writes in, can I plant Arborvitae now or is fall better? Kelly, what do you think? You can plant them whenever you can find them in a pot at the garden centers or home stores. Um, and it's probably best to plant now because you'll have the whole summer to get the root system. Many times the arborvitaes are pot bound and uh, you really have to keep them watered and planting them late in the fall. Sometimes they don't root in as well. So I would do them now. Okay. Anything to add in on that, Kelly? Yeah, um, you should probably water about a gallon and a half per caliper inch of the tree, which means let's say it's it's three inches around, so that would be six gallons. And you oh. should probably do that every two to three days in the first 12 weeks. And that after that, you can start limiting to... Um, you know, one of one one of those um, every week. It's just in the establishment period when it comes to shrubs and trees. It's really important to do that additional watering in the beginning. Okay, thank you, uh, Victoria Shepherd Fortner is uh, on, watching our live right now. She used to work for IPM and says, uh, "My favorite bug lady with a cute kissy face emoji." Kelly, <laughs> uh, let's see. Hi, Dan Phillips is here. Uh, George. Havorka, I'm sorry if I didn't say that correctly, uh, former director, producer of the show says hello and he loves that we're doing these lives. And now we've got some questions that were sent in earlier. Uh, let's see. 
931, this is a plant ID question, and you guys can jump in and both weigh in on this one. Um, I have a shrub at the end of my driveway I would like to find and purchase again to create even more of a privacy barrier. Can you assist with identification with the attached photo? Additionally, do you know of any other suggestions for a shrub that could go in the space I have circled in blue in photo three? We've got, this person is very, very uh, organized. This area is mostly shade. I have a row of dwarf burning bush that provide adequate privacy elsewhere in the yard, considered a potential spot of interest for other dwarfs. Um, so they want to know what they can add to this to, to add more privacy. What do you think? This is Anna Dowling. Okay, Anna, I had an opportunity to look at all three of your pictures and you actually sent in picture one does not match picture two. Picture one is actually a um, an exotic invasive honeysuckle. It's the Ammer honeysuckle. It's not normally sold. Um, there are other types of shrubs that you could use. And then that picture two is actually a small uh, seedling hackberry. So it's a weed in that position. And then in uh, picture three, three, you were just talking about maybe removing some lower like daylilies or something and then adding another row of some type of shrub that could get more four to five foot, if I understand your question. And the first plant that I would say is some of the viburnums. There's quite a wide variety and there is a native one, the black haw. It sometimes is a little harder to find. Another good native for shade is lindera or the spice bush. Again, when you can find it, um, I think honey suckle would work or for scythia um, again and there's a bush dervilia that is called bush honeysuckle that uh, you could use too so visiting some of the different uh, nurseries should be able to answer your questions and give you some good advice and selection of plant material and it's all out there now Wonderful. Uh, we have a plant ID question that came in on Facebook. Uh, DJ, can you show that one? We had one come in um, from Patty. She wants to know if these white foamy growths on her plants uh, is a friend or foe. Oh, and that's Kelly's. Um, it's Expertise. probably a spittle bug, um, which is a little tiny um, sap sucking bug inside of this foamy spittle. Um, yeah, it is considered, you know, not a good bug because it does sometimes pass around um, uh, viruses and uh, pathogens. So it is not one of the favorites, but I have seen it just everywhere, um, all over gardens before, and they were not treated, and those plants did just fine in the long run. So um, it would be in the uh, um, same kind of insect, like a leaf hopper. Um, so I think she could, she could hose it off. Mm, yep. Okay. All yeah, right. definitely. Um, we have a follow-up question to the arborvitae. Um, are soil amendments necessary? I, I would say that, um, it depends on the quality of your soil. If you feel that you have a well-drained soil, no soil amendments are necessary. When okay. you add amendments, it's because of poor drainage. Here she says that she's got clay soil. So um, I, I think she could add amendments. Okay. Um, and I'm going to be the exact opposite of Ella, but <laughs> you don't want us to be clones, right? Um, you know, in my urban research, um, one of the big things that we want people to not do is amend the soil when they're planting trees, because what they do is they grow all their roots in that nice, healthy soil, that amended soil, the preferred soil, and then they don't really mine into the native soils. So rather than amending the soil, I would choose a plant that can handle the soil you have. 
And I don't know for sure off my head is if Arbor Vitae is one of them. They're, they surely are planted everywhere, so they must have some soil tolerance. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would agree but, that, that that is probably good advice. And if you were to buy them bald and burlapped, they probably are in a much heavier clay type soil because they're actually grown in the ground. But lots of them are grown in containers with a very light, loose soil. So do indeed loosen the roots there, maybe remove some of that soil. And, and I could agree with Kelly to go right back into your clay. But remember that when you're digging your hole, the best soil to keep is what comes off the top. By the time you get to the bottom of the hole, that soil is even worse. So that's the soil not to Usually when you dig a hole, whatever comes out last goes in first and you want to get rid of that. And one of the biggest mistakes when people are digging their hole, especially in a clay environment, is they leave those sides slicked from shoving the soil into the ground. So uh, one of the things that we always tell you is to roughen up those sides so they don't create a barrier for the roots. Actually, it's a huge problem with uh, planting trees in an urban environment as people forget to rough up those sides. To give their roots some, some, some room in there to spread out and do the Yeah, so they, because the roots, they tend to, if they have thing, a barrier, right? they're going to grow okay. back. And so anything that creates a barrier. So just you putting the shovel in the soil creates kind of a slick barrier. Okay. Okay. Penny writes in, uh, we have a big tree in the front yard and the grass does not grow well in that area. What can they do to get some grass under a big oh, tree? Don't grow grass under trees. That's right. The tree always wins. <laughs> and um, when the tree is small, the grass can be problematic. But as the tree um, gets larger in caliper and has a larger root system, especially for maples with a very uh, shallow surface uh, fibrous root system, they're very competitive. Now, you can raise the canopy. That means that you remove some of the lower branches so that you get more light coming in um, underneath. You can change to a... Um, uh, a shady type of grass seed, which are some of the creeping fescues, but her best bet is mulch and some type of ground cover. Okay. Uh, Kelly, what are the rules with regard to planting things under trees? Can we, you know, I, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people say don't plant under trees or don't plant under certain trees. And then you go to some people's houses and they've got hostas and all kinds of trailing, you know, ground cover there. So is there a general rule? Um, just that most grass it requires sun and you, you're not going to get sun under a tree. And you know what? We, we, we try to make people happy and we say limb it up or, you know, prune it out. But really, you just don't have the right conditions to grow grass under a tree. And in the hostas would be an excellent ground cover just because they're considered a perennial doesn't mean they can't be a ground cover. And they can do very well. And, you know, other ground covers like wild ginger. Um, I'm totally digging my uh, St. John's wort right now. I'm sure Ella has a slew of ground cover she loves, gallium. I just think that they tend, to, you know, they're not going to need the sun that grass is going to need. And even the okay. shady grasses need sun. Mm -hmm. And they so get creative. I mean, you're just going to continuously have the same problem. You're never going to totally solve the problem. Okay. All right. All right. We let's see if, if we have any, no other new Facebook questions have come in. I have a question personally. So these days when you go to the uh, lawn store or, or a big box store to get fertilizer, um, I see a lot of vegetable and I see a lot of flour but what do you get for things that don't flower or don't are not a vegetable? So hostas, um, colocasia, you know, are are just our leafy decorative. Do we fertilize those? Are you supposed to, or are you just supposed to water those? And if so, which fertilizer do you buy? Well, companies have spent a lot of money and EPA registrations for you as a homeowner to pick the right product, and there are literally 
uh, unlimited different kinds out there, but most of them will have a very generalized use uh, label to follow and everything can be fertilized whether it needs it that would be the question so your elephant ears you want to grow large leaves and so I would definitely fertilize those and hostas the same way but hostas really leaves get larger because of water not necessarily fertilizer or that's been my experience a wet spring you get very large leaves if it's dry Dry, they don't get as large and um, as um, we've talked about different things become the limiting factor and fertilizer cannot overcome if there's not enough light or if there's not enough water so I like slow release fertilizers myself um, over the you know blue liquid uh, miracle grow type products I, I like the slow release I don't know what do you like Kelly um, I, I think uh, as a general uh, population of gardeners, we tend to over fertilize things. Um, you know, if I were to break it down into types of plants like shrubs and trees, I really feel like you don't ever have to fertilize those unless you actually see an issue or mm -hmm. maybe your tree went through a really stressful event like anthracnose, um, a disease that causes the leaves to fall off. When it comes to perennials, I'm like fertilize them once during a growing season and you're okay. fine because okay. most of the time the perennials that we use and that do well, do well in lean soils, meaning they don't require a ton of fertilizer. Now, my vegetables, I tend to do it like two to three times while growing the vegetables, usually about two or three weeks after I plant them, when they start to flower and then maybe three or four weeks after that, especially for tomatoes or heavy feeders. Like once they're into production. Mm -hmm. um, but then not all, um, not all vegetables are that way. So it's good to look up, you know, exactly what the requirements are. Now being a former greenhouse grower and Ella can relate to me, um, hanging baskets of annuals and annuals in your pots and annuals in your landscape they love fertilizer and you have okay. to give them fertilizer or they're not yeah. really beautiful and keep flowering. So, um, you know, I love the slow release too, because I love adding stuff and not having to worry. Um, so mm -hmm. those annuals, uh, tend to, you know, would be happy with a once a week fertilizer. Wow. Okay. I Good really to know. don't, succumb to this whole you have to use this blossom booster or this type of fertilizer and it's a little bit uh daunting to just your average gardener when you're walking down the aisle with your little cart and there's something for everything and it's just like okay well i need all of this because i have all of these and mm -hmm. it's just overwhelming if you don't if you're not a kelly or an ella <laughs> Well, well again, you know, in the greenhouse, I mean, I used a general, you know, high quality fertilizer. And of course, I had specifics for each different crop sure, sure. Me as a grower. And Ella, as a grower, too, is like that. But I don't think it's I don't think it's as important on the other end. I think as long as you fertilize. Okay. You're doing right. I think if you find a product and you read the label and the label is easy for you to understand then that's the product to buy if you can't understand what they're trying to tell you you know move to a different type one. of product <laughs> okay. yeah and and uh, i would agree with everything that kelly said about the plants that require fertilizing and um, again it's the quality of your soil and your expectations and how much time you can really devote to this and that's what they've done with some of the products that you can actually add to a gun on your hose to spray it on or mm -hmm. again the slow release feeds for four months you know one and done or whatever so you you that's where you need to see your independent local garden center and have a relationship. <laughs> or you Everyone. can call the master gardeners. Yes, the master right. gardeners call are a wonderful resource. And they have tell you exactly how lines. to fertilize. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, you're fine. Okay. Let's go to we have a couple great grapevine questions that we can do together. So the first one is 
um, from Carl Compton says, I have a grapevine that is three years old uh, that has not produced grapes and the leaves are wilting. The vine gets six plus hours of sunlight. Um, so what do you guys think? What are some possibilities uh, for a grapevine that's just not looking real hot? When you see wilted uh, vines, that probably means that there is some type of root problem or there's some type of maybe damage to the uh, base of the major cane that it can't transport water. So you need to keep going back from the wilt down to see if you can see anything or maybe even uh, check the roots, find out did you what products were used near it um, and the late freeze at least what we had over mother's day weekend was enough to really damage young grapevines that were coming out and they will relief out again if you just give them time i think okay um kelly did you have anything to add to that one or i'll ask you the the second well, one just i would look up and find out the pruning technique for grapes i can't say it off the top of my head because i'm not an expert but i know that um, on Horton services, I've done great pruning and there was a particular way that you did it and that would help maybe with the uh, production of grapes. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see, this one is about a grapevine runner. Um, had a neighbor, neighbor give me a runner from his grapevine, planted it in the ground. This was a few weeks ago. Now it, there's growth in the area, but this person, uh, Leonard Weaver, is not sure that it's a vine or if it's a vine or a weed. So how do you distinguish between the two? Well, hopefully his little runner, he can follow that back. And grapevines have kind of a heart-shaped leaf. They can make little tendrils. Um, I, it doesn't say whether he had leaves on it when it came, but it's like a little cutting. Um, I would say that three to four weeks, if it had roots when they got it, it could be growing. If it didn't have roots, three to four weeks may not be enough time. Uh, Kelly, any ideas? I mean, this is an Achilles heel for horticulture educators and master gardeners throughout the state. People send us these little tiny plants with two or three leaves and they're like, what is this? And, you know, it can be very difficult to diagnose plants in that Um so one of the things that I always do is like, you know, I have volunteers all the time. And I know Tanisha talked about these volunteers in the last show. Um, I just grow them out a little bit. You know, when they get bigger, then it's so much easier to identify them than when they're little tiny things. So I would do what Ella says and wait, let it grow a little bit. And if it doesn't right. have those great looking leaves, you probably have <laughs> a weed. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is that if you are taking time to plant some of these uh, materials, it is a good idea to mulch around them because covering that soil will prevent weed seeds from germinating. And uh, you can use in the vegetable garden straw or um, un treated grass clippings um, or in the landscape, the hardwood, a uh, hard mulches and and different things like that so if he mulched around that grapevine then there's only the grapevine <laughs> right uh, let's see Kristen says thank goodness on the fertilizer question because she's been fertilizing weekly so she nailed it on that one uh wants to know eh, I hate this I don't hate it but I know you guys don't like to do uh product questions but prune uh preen thumbs up or thumbs down okay Right, we'll I, I, <laughs> I believe that that herbicides can be uh, a necessary part of an easy way to prevent weed seeds from germinating. And that's what preen is. It's a pre-emergent herbicide that has applications um, specifically. As long as you're following the label, um, you can get good results. And I do use herbicides on occasion. Okay. Kelly, anything to add to that? Um, you know, I personally do not use that product. Um, I'm a sort of, I like to be as organic as I possibly can. I'm a big fan of like shuffle hose and Dutch hose and just getting out there every two weeks and getting those weeds uprooting them while they're small and let them bake in the sun a little bit. 
Um, that's how I manage my weeds early on. I like that you guys are the best of both worlds here. You're giving people really good information so that they can choose which path they want to go because there's no right or wrong. It just, you know, so I, I appreciate the dialogue. I do too. I love it when people don't agree with me and they have their own opinion because mm-hmm. we're not all clones. We all yeah. have different. yeah. And I think people too think that guard, you know, gardening is an exact science, but also there, there's a little bit of philosophy that comes into it. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you know, that. I'm trying to force a particular agenda, but Ella is more customer friendly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm wants going to make to her customers happy. She wants to. That's help right. Them. <laughs> she wants to help them be successful in gardening, but I want to. Save you're home. more of a science. You're the scientist. Yep. And yeah, I like it. This is a great dynamic. Also, right. I want to say just a little plug that Preen has made over here in Vermillion County. So shout out to us for uh, making that wonderful product. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Preen is made over here in Vermillion County. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Um, Kelly, was there a question that you had that you wanted to answer? I wasn't sure if you had something you wanted to cover and sorry about my dog talk about, in the background. It's a giant St. Bernard and I can't control it. <laughs> and now cue the baby. We've just got a lot going on right now. He's, uh, uh, you know, babies. babies. Uh, I was just going to talk about the clematis. Um, I chose the same question that, um, Jennifer Nelson Schultz chose. And so uh, I I answered that question. So, you know, this lady had some issues with getting her clematis to grow. And we were thinking that it was too early to freak out just yet because some clematis uh, leaf out later. And then um, we saw the picture of of her clematis and we said that she needed to mulch because clematis like to have cool roots. So if you are, um, you know, growing clematis, I think one of the things to do is wait until you see that new growth before you start pinching back potential dead growth, you know, because some clematis dies back all the way down to the ground and some doesn't. Um, And then I, I think the secret is, you know, that mulch, keeping those roots cool because they like full sun, but they don't like the warm roots. Awesome. And Ella may be able to add to that. Um, uh, again, with the clematis, you should see some more normal sized leaves. And this is where you do have to be uh, very careful with some of the uh, herbicide products because they cannot just be applied anywhere and everywhere and not have some repercussions on uh, quality plant materials. So Things that prevent weed seed germination also prevent flower seeds from germinating. Or um, certain herbicide weed killers can also cause problems with uh, with root damage on certain plant material. And there's been many court cases um, for damage on trees and shrubs. So again, not sure why, but uh, I would say you know, cut it back and hope that you get a uh, normal foliage to develop. Okay. We don't have any other questions. So before we go, um, are, is there anything else that folks are typically seeing this time of year? Um, any tips or Ella, you know, any uh, common concerns people are bringing to the greenhouse? Um, anything else for the good of the order? I just harvested my spinach Um, And I think that the secret to spinach and any types of greens is to harvest it when the leaves are less than three inches. That's when it tastes the best. So uh, if you've grown some greens this year, make sure you get out there and harvest them early. Um, You know, you can just cut them back and have let them regrow one more time. So the spinach, I cut them all back sort of by half. Then I'm going to let them regrow some more leaves. I'll cut them back again. And then I'll plant something completely different in that pot after my second spinach harvest. I also thinned my onions because I wanted to be able to have some green onions, but also grow some onions for storage. And so I just planted them closer together than I um, was supposed to for storage onions. And so, um, you know, I just 
you know, I'm like sitting there picking the leaves off the spinach. I'm like, I'm not going to waste one leaf. I grew this. <laughs> I want and all we, of it. And then we put it with eggs and cheese. It was delicious. Yeah. We've had a couple of har- I, I made some pesto the other day, nice. um, harvested some spinach. And then we did a big zoom on the lettuce and that's already with all the rain we've had, the lettuce has already filled back out and less than a week. I mean, it's crazy how fast it's grown. So mm-hmm. Ella, what about you? Anything? Uh, have you eaten anything yet? Well, I have enjoyed my rhubarb for mm. sure. Yeah. Um, that has been probably the best year yet. And we like rhubarb cobbler and uh, uh, that worked out well. And um, uh, garlic scapes, my husband said, our, we hard neck garlic sends up a, like a little corkscrew scape that will then make seed and flowers on the end. But when they're young, you can eat them. They're tender. So it's much like uh, an onion, uh, but with more of a garlic taste. Nice. I know this, this time of year is so awesome. And it's actually best to remove those garlic scapes for the bulb production. Right. Exactly. And and they're about garlic is the multiple harvest of food. (laughs) There you go. And awesome. and that's the thing is that please share all this information that you have with others so that everyone can learn how to grow. Because I do think there's been kind of a gap and there's been a big resurgence now with vegetable gardening and um, all these different varieties, heirlooms. And then, of course, I like the perennial vegetables like the rhubarb or the strawberries or the raspberries, the blackberries asparagus. Yeah, all of that. Yes, most definitely because, you know, but then a home ripened tomato. Wonderful. You yeah, just can't and don't, it. don't think it's too late to plant, still be planting. You can still plant tomatoes, um, peppers. You can throw some basil seed out there. You can. Yeah. Cilantro. Wash. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, there's still plenty you know, of time. And even a fall harvest for some things. Uh, yeah, and eggplant. Oh, I love eggplant. It is I love eggplant. It is my favorite to That's, grow. I'm so trying loofah know. this year. Loofah, we're going to try that. <laughs> Not to eat, but uh, to gift. I want to try. <laughs> yeah, I, saw, I saw a YouTube video, and the next thing I knew, I was like, I have to get loofah seeds. So we'll see how this goes. But uh, Yeah, beauty, beauty products, anything that you can make. That our beauty products yeah. from your own uh, thing is is wonderful. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. You were going to say something. Oh, so, Tanisha, my dad grew loofah in Texas. Now think about it. Ooh. Texas is really hot. <laughs> yeah. So he got and, some huge ones, didn't he? And they don't have the best soil either. So you know, I you have much better soil. And you'll probably water a lot better than my dad did. So I think you're going to be successful. I'm excited oh. to see your products. I'm ex- no, now the pressure's on. When Kelly says that, the pressure's on. I'm sorry. I feel like she's going to, I'm going to get a grade. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, she thank is. You. you guys are all my teachers. I can't tell you how much I've learned just from, just from the, doing this show. I mean, it's crazy how much I all of you, little pieces of all of you are in my garden, literally just some of the things that you say, gifts that you've given me. I've got plants from both of you in my house. So I just, it's a real nice sense of community. And I, I'm glad that more people are getting in on that. Well, just so you know, people like you make it worth it for us because oh, you know, I, here I am, I'm this, you know, plant nerd and I spout out information and most people could care less what I'm saying. But not you, Master Gardeners, man. You guys mm-hmm. will. We soak it up. Like, can you spell that, Kelly? Um, you yeah. Know? You're our, you guys are our rock stars. But anyway, I could go on and on. <laughs> yeah. We could do it's, this all night. So until it's really next nice week, when people care. It is. Well, I mean, you got to eat. And with all that's going on in the world, you know, everybody's a little cer- uncertain. Not, it's not just that we have extra time. Everybody's a little uncertain, you know. So this is this is nice to see people saying, okay, in the event of, maybe we'll all just eat tomatoes. <laughs> we'll just eat tomatoes, you know. But it's nice to see people trying to grow their own food. So it's exciting. 
So, uh, and it looks like we're going to be having these, these Zoom shows for uh, probably at least another month or so. So keep us on your schedule, ladies. And to all of you out there who are watching, we appreciate you. Uh, we're hoping that you enjoy this, you know, this nice 30, 40 minute escape from reality where you can talk about gardening with your friends. So thanks for joining and we will see you next week. And thank you ladies for sharing your time and talents. We'll see you next time. Good night.